Welcome to Face the State. I'm Ariana Bennett. Thank you for joining us. Well, my guest for this episode has quite the resume. 35 years of military service, including commanding ships in conflict zones and serving during wartime. And he's here in northern Nevada paying a visit to our legislature. I'm here with Vice Admiral Lee Gunn now. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, Ariana. I so appreciate your time. Now, 35 years in the Navy, describe what that was like. Um, it was wonderful serving with sailors and Marines and soldiers and airmen over the years. They're, they represent in many ways the best of America. And so it was a treat uh, to work with them every day. Uh, it was a challenge. Um, I was never bored. Uh, I was tired, cold, hungry, hot, shot at, not hit. You know all those <laughs> all those things. So, um, but military service on behalf of the people in the country is a true honor and a real pleasure. And you you really have seen firsthand some of the biggest conflicts that our country has been in. Um, what have you taken from that? Um, I started in Vietnam and I finished in Somalia um, with regard to conflicts after the Cold War, which was the intervening period. Um, I think that America is well represented by her military, all the people in uniform, the men and women in uniform. Um, I think the support of the American people is tremendously important for their military. And uh, people at home should never forget that it's real sons and daughters who are going uh, to sea, who are going to fly, who are going to uh, serve overseas and in the United States. So it's a tremendous responsibility, I believe, on the part of the citizens to understand what is being done for and potentially what will be done to the people in the military. Uh, and so that's a, that's a real serious consideration that I'm afraid is not often uh, taken as seriously as it should be. Yeah, and that's a part of our conversation today. Now, you know, after you retired, you kind of moved on to um, the Center for Naval Analyses. Correct. You want to tell me what that does? Yeah, the Center for Naval Analyses uh, has a history with the Navy uh, starting in 1942. Uh, it's an organization that is almost entirely civilian, uh, composed of engineers, scientists, uh, economists, uh, uh, political scientists, people who look at serious military problems and try to find solutions that they can present as options to decision makers in government, uh, entirely until recently in the Defense Department. Um, I, when I retired from the Navy, I went to work for CNA. and. I was asked to develop a non-defense business, still the nonprofit model that CNA has always oper operated under. Uh, and I did that for several years until I retired last year. Um, during that time, I was asked to join the <coughs> Military Advisory Board, oh, excuse me, being sponsored by the Center for Naval Analyses Corporation. Uh, and I've been a pleasure, it's been a pleasure to be part of the Military Advisory Board now for 10 years. Now, as a part of this work, CNA developed a list of the biggest threats facing our national security. Right. Some of them are obvious, you know, terrorism, we know. Um, but one of them really interested me and surprised me, and that was climate change. Why do you see climate change as such a threat to our national security? Well, um, we issued a report that was compiled between 2006 and 2007. Um, it was written by 11 retired uh, admirals and generals, mostly three and four stars. Uh, and it had occurred to both them and to the, the CNA Corporation, which was working on behalf of the Defense Department and research, uh, that the climate was changing in ways that increasingly looked like they would make it more difficult to assure the security of the United States. Um, and so this group was convened based on their, not only, not their expertise in climatology and climate science, but their expertise in research uh, and in um, national security affairs. And so for the first time in 2007, CNA produced a report, the Military Advisory Board produced a report that was focused on climate change. It uh, imagine the kind of future that young men and women who would serve in uniform would have to face uh, everywhere in the world. What would the demands be and how would those demands increase or change in character? More than that, what was the threat at home to the things that needed to be done domestically to prepare a military to go to war if the need arose? How would the ranges, the training ranges be affected? Um, 
for example, here in the West, uh, increasing number of range fires uh, and days uh, when the ranges were closed due to the threat of fire inhibits the training that needs to take place for driving lo lo dropping live ordnance and, and firing weapons. Um, increasing uh, floods and, uh, for example, um, prevented the use of a, a major operating area in Louisiana for the Army. Sea level rise threatens our bases at home and around the world. Some of the, uh, the ones that are threatened most, most, uh, in a most devastating way are on the east and Gulf Coast of the United States. Um, so it's, it affects the way the military operates, the demand for the service of the U.S. military in establishing or reestablishing stability in places that matter around the world to the American people. Um, and so it was the first time, as far as I know, that the uh, conditions that we anticipate with a change in climate were portrayed by people who were looking at it strictly from a national security perspective. And looking at it globally also, you wrote in, in a report that I read that climate change could have a destabilizing effect on, on regions that are already unstable. Absolutely. Um, failing states or failed states uh, are regrettably incubators for unrest. Um, changes in the agriculture patterns in East Africa, that is the boundary, the, the climate changes and the boundary shifts between the herders and the other forms of agriculture. And so the people need to move as well. Um, there's always somebody there when you move into a new piece of territory and that gives rise to problems. Um, in my Somalia experience, I was in, the, um, in many of the refugee camps in northern Kenya where Somali refugees had ended up as a result of un unrest among the clans in Somalia. Uh, that's emblematic of the kind of problems that I think we're going to see increasingly around the world. And also humanitarian assistance and disaster relief has become an increasingly demanding uh, set of missions for the Navy and the Marine Corps, but also for the Air Force and the Army. Right, and, and also clean drinking water, right? I think one of the examples you gave was um, ice sheets in South Asia supply a lot of the clean drinking water to the populations there. And um, you know, the last thing we want to see is water disputes between countries that already have some tension. Exactly. Uh, China in Mongolia owns the headwaters. Uh, at the glaciers in Mongolia feed the headwaters of the five major Asian rivers. Um, there are, are nearly three billion people who depend on that water. Uh, as the glaciers melt, and they have been melting, they're, they're temporarily being restored, but the long-term trend is that these glaciers will melt when they're no longer there to provide a year-long supply of water, then these streams, these rivers, will become uh, seasonal. And the, the way of life for enormous numbers of people will, will have to change. Uh, CNA did a really interesting uh, game, a decision game, in South Asia um, with players from uh, China, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. The, the, people, the, the peoples who share uh, the Brahmaputra River uh, and the decisions upstream by the Chinese or the Pakistanis will make an enormous difference to the, the people downstream in India and Bangladesh. And so this put the players who were former officials who'd had water responsibilities in these four countries in the position of having to make choices as realistically as possible about changing climate conditions sharing of the water, um, and reacting to the choices that are made by others who share that water resource. Now, worst case scenario, if nothing is done to manage this situation, how much impact to this global climate change issue will we feel in the United States? Uh, well, that's hard to say, and there are a variety of opinions, but of course the military uh, deals in risk and risk management. Um, the, the, the changes that we're seeing in the climate need to be confronted in two ways. Uh, one is mitigation, that is we need to reduce the amount of change that we experience to lessen its consequences. And on the other hand, 
we need to adapt to the things about climate change that we will be unable to, um, to confront and stop during our lifetimes or the lifetimes of our kids or grandkids. Um, sea levels are rising and will continue to rise. Um, the melting of the Arctic uh, is a serious national security issue only because the Arctic has not been a contested area for resources, and now it's becoming a contested area. Um, the melting of the Arctic will only make a modest difference in sea level. It's only because uh, as the water warms, it becomes slightly um, larger, slightly higher. Um, but what does matter is the melting of the ice sheets in Greenland, which are all, of course, on land, and the western Antarctic uh, ice sheet as well. And so not knowing exactly when these things are going to happen in a dramatic way or in a gradual way means that the estimates for sea level rise uh, run from a couple of feet to uh, 30 feet during the course of this century. Um, I'm not an expert in that, so I don't know which one of those to take, but none of them are very good for us. Um, from the military's point of view, the uh, Hampton Roads area in Norfolk, Virginia, and the surrounding area is the largest set of military installations anywhere in the world. Um, and the sea has already risen in this last century 14 uh, inches or more. Uh, it's making a difference. There are floods all the time, and we're seeing those um, every month. So the consequences are already beginning to confront us. There are some things we're going to have to change, in my estimation, about human behavior. And a move into renewable energy, reducing our carbon, our carbon footprint, is going to be an essential element of confronting climate change. That's the mitigation part. We'll deal with the things we have to adapt to that we can't otherwise change, but we need to change our behavior uh, in pretty profound ways, but in ways that I think also will be beneficial and have other uh, positive aspects for us. Now, quickly, because we're, we don't have a ton of time, do you feel that that message is being well received? You live in D.C. I mean, is it being well received among people there and then as you travel across the country? Uh, people there, yes and no. Um, th there are people, the Defense Department is making these changes. Um, it is using on the front lines in Iraq and Afghanistan renewable energy so that it lightens the load that has to be carried in, in batteries by troops who go out, on, go out on patrol and otherwise are carrying 100 pounds of kit. Um, the, uh, the supply lines for fuel uh, in the forward areas uh, need to be uh, reduced. The convoys need to become far less frequent because of the exposure that these supply lines uh, uh, result in for the troops who man the convoys. Um, we've, lost, we've lost lots of soldiers and Marines in the process of providing fuel for generators and forward operating bases in these remote areas. Um, so th there is a lot that needs to be done, and the military, I believe, is really doing its part. Um, all of the air aircraft, for example, flown by any branch of the U.S. military uh, have been certified to fly on biofuels. It's not that we need to pay as much as biofuels cost right now, but we need to know that in the future, these aircraft without modification will be able to use biofuels if that's what's available in the area in which we need to operate. Uh, around the rest of the country, I think exciting things are happening. Um, whether or not the, the federal government leads, um, the, the rest of the country is taking steps that are making dramatic progress. I'm excited to be back in Nevada for that very reason. I was here in September, looked to me like lots of the things that were being considered, lots of the energy that was being devoted was going to pay off pretty soon. And so it's terrific to be back in Nevada after that first visit. Okay, well that's a perfect chance for us to take a break, but stay with us. And after the break, I'll be back with Vice Admiral Lee Gunn to talk about why he's here in Northern Nevada, what he's asking for. Stay with us.